Morning uh, cardiology rounds. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Pietro De Santo. A lot of us know Pietro well. He did his cardiology training with us. I uh, then went on and did an interventional cardiology fellowship and uh, is completing a critical care medicine uh, fellowship. Uh, he's also working on his PhD in uh, epidemiology and uh, public health, uh, and he will be joining us as faculty uh, upcoming uh, this summer. So uh, we welcome him here today. Looking forward to having you join us. Uh, and he's going to present rounds on uh, training involvement in clinical research, lessons learned from the Raptor study. So go ahead, Pietro. Thank you, Dr. Stadnick. Um, as uh, Dr. Stadnick mentioned, you know, I've been doing a lot of training uh, so far. You know, I'm just in the process of finishing my 10th year of postgrad medical education. And um, over that time, I've you know, as I've progressed through internal medicine, cardiology, interventional cardiology, critical care, you know, I simultaneously tried to complete a PhD as well. And so I think I'm at the end of this, you know, 10 years of training, I feel well poised to give a, a bit of a perspective, uh, potentially a unique perspective on kind of trainee involvement in clinical research. And I'm going to do that in the context of the uh, Raptor study, which is a study that I started up with Ben Hibbert back in um, in 2017-2018 uh, uh, when I was a cardiology resident. Um, and again, the purpose of this talk is not really the Raptor study itself, but more to just sort of provide uh, context uh, to some of these lessons uh, that I've learned over the years. <clears throat> I am just getting over this cough that's ha I've had for like two months, so hopefully I don't start having a coughing fit. <clears throat> um, sorry, give me one sec. I don't really have any disclosures to declare, aside from the fact that I do have a desire to spark an interest in research in all of the trainees in the room and online. Um, I do think that there's a lot of value uh, to, you know, getting formal research training, um, <clears throat> but um, I acknowledge that that's not necessarily for everybody, but I'll try to convert those that I can. Um, we'll go over why I think research training is actually important. What are some of the challenges associated with uh, formalized research training? <coughs> Excuse me. What are some of the different pathways that you can become a medical researcher? And then I've kind of put put together so what I what I sort of called the you know principles of you know a collaborative trainee led type uh, environment. Um, and uh, again, with some highlights from the Raptor study as I, as we progressed uh, through that trial. You know, ensuring that um, trainees, uh, physicians in training, uh, acquire sufficient knowledge, experience, understanding of medical research, I think is a universal and longstanding issue, particularly as we've really uh, grown with more and more evidence-based medicine over the last number of decades. I think all institutions uh, preparing medical trainees for practice have, a, have an obligation uh, to balance the acquisition of not only specific clinical knowledge pertaining to their specialty, but also and to ensure that doctors are equipped to remain competent as medical science advances, you know, even cardiology, despite it being so well studied over, you know, decades, it, there's still so many unanswered questions. You know, every year at multiple international conferences, there are late breaking clinical trials, which are surprising to many of us. And really, as the field continues to advance, we need to make sure that we have uh, we have trained people with the skill set to uh, perform critical appraisal. And um, you know, I do think that you know most professional medical bodies acknowledge that uh, this requires trainees to experience some degree of research education. Again, not only to carry out their own original research, but to become good consumers of uh, medical literature um, that will help shape their practice throughout their entire careers. And I think that this is likely, at least in part, why many of the FRCPC, if not all, require uh, residency programs require. Um, uh, completion of at least one scholarly project during their clinical training. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there still remain a lot of barriers to accomplishing what I think is an ambitious aim. You know, medical trainees are occupied um, with clinical practice, particularly those with like hands on type specialties, including the surgical uh, trainees. Um, you know, they're trying to really balance the acquisition of not only clinical knowledge base, but also a practical skill set. Um, Universities may not necessarily offer educational activities which are timely or accessible, and therefore that may result in some limited opportunities. I think some some trainees experience a period of research as a means to an end. You know, they feel that they need to, they're doing it because they have to do it in order to you know make their application more competitive for uh, subspecialty training, for example. Um, and they don't really embrace uh, the process of conducting research and and benefit from all the learning that can be provided from that. <coughs> 
you know, and for those who do it, who do wish to undertake a period of formal research training, there are, you know, some difficulties in terms of different pathways that that can be explored within, um, but there may be limited options overall. And, you know, it can sometimes become difficult to uh, or increasingly difficult to obtain time to actually conduct your research. Um, funding is always a, a bit of a barrier and, um, you know, funding for for formalized research training can be extremely competitive. And, um, you know, I think trainees may ultimately uh, they, there might be a you know, lack of access to uh, teaching or role models um, to, that can inspire uh, trainees to really um, try to uh, develop themselves as a medical researcher. And I think ultimately this can lead into like a self-fulfilling prophecy where you have some inadequate support. Um, you know, many trainees put off the idea of research altogether, or they start research. They start research uh, projects that are too ambitious or not feasible, uh, which leads to um, failure and then a further aversion to conducting more research. And again, you're in this negative cycle. And I think we do have the opportunity to break this cycle. And I, uh, I think fundamentally, positive research experiences must be encouraged. Um, this is a figure that's probably familiar to most. Uh, Jeff Marbach, uh, former cardiology resident here. Um, published this in Jack back in 2017, looking at our experience of developing a formalized cardiology research curriculum uh, in our core uh, program and uh, has demonstrated that uh, in the blue bars there with no formal research training compared to the orange bars, formal research training, that we've actually been able to improve academic productivity as measured by publications. Now, that's not the best measure. Um, and obviously that's a limitation, but uh, certainly it's one of the measures that we use as a bit of a currency in our world uh, to really be able to document that you were productive uh, from a research perspective. And again, this I think that by having opportunities like a formalized research curriculum within our program, we are able to um, further foster positive research experiences, and that could break that self-fulfilling uh, prophecy and negative cycle. And Omar Abdel Rezek, who's also joining on staff in in the summer this year as a structural interventional cardiologist who many of you uh, know um, sort of further this work done by Jeff looking at not only the the accomplishments during uh, training but kind of looked beyond um, uh, into the early career phase uh, early career years and 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 beginning of the mid-career years in terms of academic productivity again the orange bars demonstrating that um, more publications compared to uh, with formal research training compared to not and um, <clears throat> I think that you know all of these positive research experiences could ultimately result in this lifelong kind of academic inquisitiveness and um, um, <coughs> you know and and it could actually even translate into considerable uh, contributions I think to teaching medical education and uh, as a result I, I would argue that all of these things could potentially improve patient care overall. So how do we foster these positive research experiences? I mean, I think many of us are aware of informal research opportunities that exist. Um, this could be things like, you know, summer student programs coming, uh, summer students coming through uh, and, and helping out with a project or, you know, writing up a case report um, with a staff that uh, regarding an interesting case that you've seen on the wards or in the CCU, for example. Um, but then there are also formalized uh, pathways. And again, in, in the cardiology residency program here, we've we've did under, you know, Dr. Froschel, uh, we've, we've developed this formalized cardiology residency uh, research curriculum whereby all of the first year cardiology residents um, typically during block five um, of their first year are all of them are on research rotation together. There are uh, there's an opportunity for them to receive teaching sessions from, uh, you know, the medical librarians from, um, <clears throat> you know, um, uh, from uh, Dr. Wells from a uh, sort of an introduction to epidemiology perspective. There's also um, an opportunity for them to complete, you know, regulatory trainings like uh, GCP modules, etc. And uh, this is something that actually has, has again, I think um, demonstrated that it is effective, um, as I showed in the previous couple of slides. <laughs> and it's actually something that I'm working with in, in the critical care medicine residency program at TOH to help establish within their ICU curriculum as well. Um, you know, I think the ICU there does a lot of research already, uh, but really there's not a lot of training involvement compared to at the Heart Institute, where many of our residents are on the front lines of clinical trials, recruiting for studies like Safari STEMI, Capital Chill, um, you know, Do Re Mi, um, uh, et cetera. And so really, I think, um, uh, you know, I'm going to try to help them develop a bit of their program so that more of their critical care fellows are able to participate in in uh, in research during their two years as a, as a critical care fellow. 
I think also there are formal research training pathways, um, including the MD-PhD program, which many of you are familiar with, the clinician investigator program, and then the clinical, uh, clinical scholar roads. And, and uh, just kind of dissecting those a little bit uh, more, I think that the main thing that I want to highlight here is that, you know, these formalized research training pathways are limited to a select few individuals. Um, and I think that, um, you know, if we just limited our, our, um, our teaching of research methodology and how to conduct re, you know rigorous research to just the people that do these next few programs or, or go pursue these streams i think we're actually doing a disservice to the vast majority of our trainees for example in the md phd program they only take four students per year you know and um, this is divided up into two years of pre-clerkship three years of a phd not in epidemiology so it can't be an epi based uh, phd and then um, and then uh, subsequently two years of clinical clerkship and again limited only to four students. Similarly, the clinician investigator program, which is actually how I'm completing my PhD and I'll get into that in just a moment, like, uh, only takes two to four residents per year. Again, limiting it to the number of people that are able to pursue formalized research uh, training during their during their um, either undergraduate or postgraduate uh, medical education. The CIP program is divided up into two different options. Broadly speaking, there's the graduate studies options, and those are for people that don't have a grad degree already uh, that can pursue either a master's or a PhD um, during two years of dedicated research time. And there are different pathways in which you can do that. There's a, you know, a um, sort of a consecutive stream where you do take two years off in the middle, for example, of your general surgery residency between, you know, your PGY four or five years would be dedicated research. Then you'd return to clinical duties um, um, after you've completed those two years. Or what I had done is actually a fractionated pathway. So uh, during, uh, I completed my first year of cardiology residency clinically. My second year, so my C2 year, I actually did a one year dedicated research year. So like 13 blocks of research electives, if you will. And um, I was able to do all the coursework for a master's and actually then fast track into a PhD program. Um, and then I completed the remaining two years in three to six month increments of research over the rest of my training uh, in that sort of dedicated fashion that way. They also have a postgrad studies option through the CIP program where um, uh, it's for those who have already completed a graduate degree and wish to further their research career development in kind of a postdoctoral uh, type setting. Um, and again, this is limited to only a few uh, residents per year. <laughs> um, the clinical, uh, the clinical scholar route is something that many people are probably familiar with as well. This is a sort of formal research training that's completed after residency or fellowship, um, and it's typically done in conjunction with your first couple of years of being on staff. Um, and uh, this is a combination of kind of clinical uh, obligations, but also some protected academic time to complete, you know, a master's of science or education or quality improvement, that sort of thing. And so <clears throat> these are some of the formalized research pathways that exist. And again, they're limited to to a select few people. So how do we how do we actually train other people that don't pursue these formalized pathways to become good medical researchers, how to become good consumers of medical literature. And I think that that extends into this notion of a kind of a research collaboration. And, um, you know, I think historically, as I said, trainees, you know, kind of self identified or were assigned a mentor, a research mentor, and together they would develop a project that the trainee um, would see through to completion, starting with things like, you know, protocol development, ethics applications, data acquisition and analysis, uh, ultimately manuscript preparation and submission. And again, these are kind of like your summer students or your residents requiring uh, or completing a um, scholarly mm -hmm. project as required for their training program. Mm -hmm. um, but scientific this is work not is what being... it was built to be. Sorry, Let's down. Some, mm -hmm. somebody's uh, Did you mic is on. Doctor Doctor Redpath, uh, Doctor Beanlands is saying your microphone is on. Um, so as I was saying, there's kind of this traditional kind of mentor mentee relationship kind of one on one, um, but scientific work is increasingly being done, excuse me, by collaborative networks, which have these common interests and goals with respect to performing rigorous research. And, you know, these networks could be local, multi, multi institutional or even international. Um, you know, and I think having this forum where trainees can engage in research with the advice and support of experienced uh, researchers and peers uh, that allows them to have the flexibility to conduct research uh, in combination with their clinical training, I think could be very, very beneficial. And I think such a venture would allow trainees uh, to to be involved across an entire spectrum. Right. And so, you know, you could really tailor the experience as a group to um, uh, you know, not everybody needs to be doing their PhD in epidemiology to be part of the group, but there can be 
you know, some people that do that. And there's others that may want to just, you know, lead smaller projects, like post hoc analyses of trials, um, you know, conduct a systematic dream analysis. And there might be people that are just happy to be kind of more worker bees. You know, they want to be involved in that milieu of, of research environment, uh, but they're happy to, you know, be a screening, uh, to be a screener for systematic review meta analysis, for example. Um, and that's really kind of the limit of where they want to uh, reach with their with their uh, training exposure, uh, research training exposure. And, you know, I do think that there's a lot of value to this and something that certainly, you know, I've benefited tremendously from, you know, I am part of a, a collaborative, if you will. Um, you know, I think, and just to highlight, this is more than just a group of people who publish together. Really, th this is a group of kind of like-minded individuals who have um, uh, who have come together to really capitalize on individual strengths of each person uh, to really build a, a research program. And, you know, as many of you know, Ben Hibbert um, has has had a strong interest in academic uh, medicine, basically, you know, certainly for as long as I've known him. And, you know, he's a pretty bright mind. And we um, he um, kind of took a lot of people under his wing to kind of really develop this program, this research program. And it started, you know, really with Trevor uh, Samard and Dan Ramirez. Um, again, many of you will know all of these uh, three folks. And, um, you know, they all work together and uh, Dr. O'Brien's uh, you know, basic science lab, and they developed a you know a strong friendship and and peer collaboration, and together they really started what was kind of this group of people coming together to really accomplish, I think, pretty pretty good work. Um, that that collaborative has now expanded tremendously, and uh, it includes Rebecca Matthew, who is a clinician scientist here and our CCU director, as you all know. Omar Abdel Rezek, who I've already mentioned, is coming on as a structural interventional cardiologist in the summertime, uh, who has a master's of science. You know, Richard Jung, who's an internal medicine uh, uh, resident, uh, actually chief internal medicine resident, and uh, has completed his PhD in CMM. Um, uh, Puya, Ma, <coughs> Puya, who's uh, in the room here as well, and um, is currently completing the CIP program and doing a PhD in epidemiology. Simon Parlow, who's been an integral member of our group for many years and uh, has recently completed his cardiology training and uh, uh, now doing critical care uh, medicine. The guy follows me around all the time. I can't get rid of him. And um, and Shannon Fernando, who many of you may not know, but Shannon is a is a you know world class researcher um, who uh, is an intensivist at Lake Ridge uh, down in the GTA, um, who has a real uh, you know really high level of expertise in uh, you know big data using ICES um, uh, to look at outcomes and and really we've been able to uh, integrate them into our group seamlessly and and we've been doing a lot of work in sort of long-term outcomes of things like cardiogenic shock and whatnot and um, you know it's it's a result of this kind of in, you know interdisciplinary multifaceted collaboration that I think has led to a lot of our success and you know one of the things that our group is working on is the capital Raptor study and um, Again, the focus of the talk is not really to talk about the methodology or the, the science behind the Raptor study, but more to use it as a, as a context to frame the, the things that I've learned over the years as a as a research trainee. Um, just to just to put things into context, a little bit about the Raptor study. So transradial access, as many of you know, is actually guideline recommended. This started to, you know, the, the CCS 2019 STEMI guidelines um, recommended radial of femoral access and STEMI patients uh, with a strong recommendation and a moderate quality of evidence. The AHA 2021 coronary revest guidelines made the same recommendation, but this time for all patients with acute coronary syndromes with a class one level of evidence A uh, recommendation. And this was further supported by the most recent ESC guidelines, again saying that radial access is the recommended approach for all patients with acute coronary syndrome. Um, and um, the Raptor study has to do with radial access, obviously, if this is why I'm talking about it. And, you know, our, our group has contributed uh, to some of the science behind radial versus femoral access. Uh, so one of this, this is one of the manuscripts that's being included in my PhD. Um, and uh, I worked with uh, Trevor Samard and Michelle LeMay uh, looking at, um, you know, outcomes of patients. Um, you know, we pooled um, 14 studies and nearly 12,000 patients. Um, and here in this force plot, you can see the all cause mortality at 30 days uh, being uh, significantly reduced with radial access compared to femoral. And this is not shown here, but this is also um, the same uh, the same story with things like major bleeding and access site. And so, you know, we've developed, uh, you know, some evidence that um, radial access is, is better than femoral access. 
you know, but radial access may not be this sort of panacea. It may not, it may not be without its own risks. You know, one of the things that we talk about a lot from a technical perspective in the cath lab is the risk of things like catheter induced coronary artery dissection. Um, you know, the catheters were designed to be used from the femoral. We're using them from the radial. Maybe they don't sit perfectly. Maybe the intubation is not as coaxial as it could be. You know, and if you power inject, you can actually cause hydrodissection of the intima of the vessel, or you could the catheter itself can actually just result in mechanical trauma and lead to dissection. Um, you know, there's, you know, the most common complication from radial access is radial artery occlusion. Again, leading up to the buildup of what the raptor study is looking at here. And, but uh, just taking a second there with the coronary artery dissection piece, um, you know, Paul Boland and I uh, worked with Ben to look at, uh, you know, 90,000 uh, left heart caths performed at the Heart Institute over a 15 year period. And we found a total of 142 cases of catheter induced dissection. So the incidence is very, very low, uh, suggesting that, you know, both radial and femoral access are safe from this perspective. Um, and you can see here that, you know, we could, this is a, the central illustration from the, from the paper where um, to, on the left side of the screen, you can see when we were predominantly transfemoral prior to 2012, um, the incidence of catheter induced dissection was actually much greater from the radial than compared to the femoral. But as we've uh, adapted to the learning curve associated with radial access, um, that incidence of um, uh, catheter induced coronary artery dissection has decreased dramatically. And really, there's no difference now in terms of radial versus femoral on kind of an all comers uh, level uh, uh, when you look at it in all comers. Um, and again, that you know, th these are just sort of some of the nuances to radial access and, and whatnot. But Really, the, I think the crux of it is the um, uh, radial artery occlusion. So the most common complication of a transradial angiogram is that about 5.2% of the time, patients will actually develop a blood clot that stays in the radial artery and prevents us from being able to use it again in the future. Uh, and that's what really led to the, the capital Raptor study uh, it's, itself, where we're using rivaroxaban to see if we can prevent radial artery occlusion. And this, the sort of background from it is that RAO is felt to be a thrombotic complication. There's this, you know, uh, pro-inflammatory milieu of the of the sheath and the catheters going up and down. You're 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 disturbing the uh, endothelium and intima. Um, that can, uh, you know, after the procedure we do patent hemostasis, but there is some degree of um, of um, you know stasis in general uh, by the compression devices we're using. And so we're basically meeting all the criteria of Virchow's triad to result in a blood clot. Um, we know that interprocedural anticoagulation with heparin can reduce the incidence of this complication, and PCI has been associated with less radial artery occlusion. Again, likely more so due to the fact that you give therapeutic anticoagulation as opposed to kind of more of a prophylactic dose like we do for diagnostic angiography. And there's some observational data that patients on anticoagulation for another indication, for example, patients with atrial fibrillation also have less uh, radial artery occlusion. And so that led to the study hypothesis where can we actually introduce a short course of post-procedural anticoagulation? Then that could potentially reduce the incidence of uh, radial artery occlusion. And the Raptor study has grown to become this international multicenter RCT um, that uh, that I've had the privilege of leading uh, as a trainee uh, for the last number of years. Uh, participants are randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to receive rivaroxaban 15 milligrams for seven days uh, versus no additional anticoagulation, and everybody comes back uh, for an ultrasound uh, of the radial artery to document occlusion or patency at the 30-day mark, and then we also assess bleeding complications, um, and we're recruiting uh, just over 1,800 patients. And so what are some of the milestones that have, ha that have taken place during the Capital Raptor study? I'd argue that the, uh, the timeline for Capital Raptor actually starts well before we even designed the protocol, well before we put the first patient into the study, and probably starts back in 2013 when I first, uh, you know, I start my clerkship. Uh, I'm working on internal medicine. Uh, I'm on call one night. Trevor Samard is uh, the senior resident who's on call, and we have the opportunity to review a consult up on D5 uh, medicine at the Civic, and we you know, he starts asking me about my interest in research. Um, and, um, you know, I think that one, one of the things that um, that I've learned over time is that um, it's it's um, not every trainee is sort of built the same and people have varying interests and, and varying uh, uh, desire to participate in research. And at the time I was actually somewhat reluctant to, to under, you know, pursue more research and whatnot, but Trevor encouraged me to meet with uh, with Ben, who at the time himself was still a fellow, um, and we, you know, sort of talked about 
research endeavors and whatnot. And, and really, this, this leads to my sort of first principle. I think it's as a trainee, it's very important that you figure out what research it is that you want to accomplish. Um, and there is a spectrum of research interests and goals. As I mentioned, you know, people may want to come in and help out with a project or two. People may want to, you know, develop formal research, research uh, uh, training and expertise. People may want to uh, lead big trials, um, right? And and I think having having um, the ability to figure out exactly as a trainee what it is that you want to do um, is very very helpful to ensure your success. And I think ultimately this can in, can involve over time. Um, you know, again, if you try to you try to put a square peg in a round hole, it may not fit. And really trying to figure out um, how to best meet the expectations on both sides of the mentor and mentee relationship, I think, were our our um, our our uh, key. <coughs> again, even in our own research collaborative, we've had uh, an entire spectrum. The people that I that I showed on the slide uh, a few slides ago have sort of been the the people that I've d demonstrated a. Uh, interest to pursue kind of uh, more formalized training and and lead uh, studies, um, but there have been many other residents and trainees, medical students, for example, that have come through uh, um, and will collaborated with us in the past uh, for smaller projects uh, here and there. And so, you know, I think it's important to have that diversity um, uh, uh, available. You know, um, for for myself, I actually had a fairly poor research experience during my undergrad. I, I worked with a supervisor who. Um, Basically, I was doing a lot of, you know, uh, tasks that were things like, you know, um, uh, you know, very tedious data extraction, et cetera. And then when ultimately it led to publications, I was not included on the paper, uh, which, you know, was a bit sort of frustrating for me. And um, that kind of really turned me off. I found the work itself very tedious. I found the, um, you know, the fact that I wasn't sort of acknowledged in a publication uh, really off-putting and that kind of set up for me that bit of a negative cycle, uh, that self-fulfilling prophecy that maybe research wasn't for me, not really understanding that research was much more than what I had been exposed to during during my undergrad. And it wasn't until I met Trevor and Ben um, that, you know, I, I was able to actually flourish and become, um, you know, a, 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 a formal, you know, a research trainee as well. And, um, you know, it's it's thankful, I'm thankful to their mentorship and, and uh, support over the years. Um, and I was ultimately able to pursue formalized training uh, and become on track to, uh, to get on track to becoming a clinician scientist. And similarly, it's not just about the trainee, but it's also about the mentor. I think that, um, you know, your research mentor should have attributes uh, from which the trainee can learn. And, um, and it, I think it's imperative that as trainees in research, we identify inspirational mentors who are, who are, you know, fairly charismatic, they endorse, um, you know, a, sort of a collective enterprise there. They lend authority and they, they give credibility to the work that's being done. Um, and it's and it's more than just guidance. I think a mentor should offer research experience, confidence, direction. Um, they should they should be asking the right questions. They should be dissuading poor ideas, which can be very challenging. Um, but uh, I think having the right mentor is key to to um, to um, advocating for your success as a as a research trainee, I think ultimately this can be very very difficult to achieve, and and even people who you think might be great mentors may not be, and it's really difficult sometimes to sort of back away from a relationship that's been established if if it's not being fruitful for either party, right, to the mentor or the mentee or the overall sort of research mission of of a particular group, you know, and in my case, I I think I've benefited tremendously from from two great mentors again. Ben and, and uh, Dr. George Wells have been instrumental uh, to my success over the years. And, you know, I, I'm lucky I did find the right mentors. I, um, you know, Ben's clinical um, experience and, and uh, research vigor uh, combined with Dr. Wells's, you know, profound methodology experience has been instrumental uh, to shaping me uh, into becoming a clinician scientist. Um, the next milestone that I think, again, is still before the Raptor study starts. I think that it's important to recognize that it's important to work as part of a group. I think I've tried to highlight that already, you know, and I think you really want to develop that that network. I think that, that your collaboration should be formed by members that can help build experience, learn skills, share responsibility, you know, encourage uh, participation and provide support to new and longstanding members of the group. Um, this isn't limited to local networks. In fact, um, it can extend to national or international uh, uh, collaborations. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I think these collaboratives should build on strong links 
uh, with support of academic faculty, which can offer technical skills, knowledge, rigor, uh, depth and experience for the do's and don'ts of research. Um, and I think it's fundamental to really surround yourself with the people who will help you uh, flourish and be successful in your research endeavors. Um, you know, for trainees, I think being part of a network and a group of people can be really helpful, um, you know, because if everybody's kind of, you know, if you have a resident champion on one particular project, but other people are able to come in and help keep things moving along and work together to see a project be completed in a timely fashion, you know, I think the quid pro, the, the quid pro quo here is that you're actually able to, uh, you know, get your names on more papers. And again, not the best measure of academic productivity, but certainly the currency that we currently deal with uh, in terms of demonstration of research uh, success is manuscripts published, right? And so, um, you know, it gives you an opportunity as a trainee to be involved with the group that, you know, hopefully will lead to more co-authorship as well. And in the Capital Raptor network that we have, you know, we've got a spectrum of, you know, trainees and that, that uh, you know, um, has been very successful in terms of assisting us with recruitment and follow-up of these patients. Um, you know, all the cardiology residents and interventional cardiology fellows uh, help assist with recruitment and identification of patients. We've got very supportive uh, faculty. So, you know, Ben Ben and I started the trial, but obviously I'll get to it in a, in a little bit. But when Ben left, um, you know, Dr. Labanas was able to step up and be the site PI with all of his uh, research experience. Um, you know, we've got a, a national and an international network that's uh, developing uh, with Dr. Bunasar in, in Kingston uh, and uh, with Dr. Samard at uh, Mayo Clinic. You know, we've really been able to establish, I think, a very key network uh, for this particular trial as well. The next milestone is that, you know, I'm starting cardiology in 2017, uh, which feels like an eternity ago. Um, and, uh, you know, Raptor comes up as an idea. And some of the things that Ben and I were talking about was, you know, how do you actually, you know, how do you pick a dose of rivaroxaban? How do you, you know, how are we practically going to randomize the patients? Where are we going to get the drugs? How much does the drug cost? Uh, all these things. And and one of the things that the take home that I, that I sort of have as we were debating about this is that it's never too early to apply for funding. And I think that one of the things that, you know, we can lead to a lot of disappointment is that you, you apply for funding, you put a lot of work into it, and you don't get the funding. And you know that can be a bit discouraging. And I and I mean I think that's the life of an academic uh, physician in general. Um, you're disappointed more often than not when it comes to funding applications. But you know I think there's a lot to be said about granting uh, grant funding applications as a learning opportunity. You know in the Raptor study, I had the opportunity to apply for various funding uh, strategies, including CIHR project grants, Heart and Stroke Foundation, um, and even smaller competitions like the CCS. Perivascular award, um, which was the only funding we've we've received for the Raptor study, um, and I was awarded that at, in the fall of 2019. Um, it was a very small research grant to to help fund some of the uh, drugs for um, the uh, for the River Oxy for the study, and you know, but I think that putting together these grant submissions was a great learning opportunity uh, for me as a trainee. You know, you're, you're you really have to work on your ability to. Uh, kind of sell your protocol in a way that you think would be uh, well received by the reviewers of your funding application, um, all while still, you know, being busy clinically um, and working on other um, research initiatives. And <clears throat> I think there are increasing opportunities for trainees to be involved in funding applications. I think having trainees um, listed as co-investigators uh, on uh, CHR project grants, for example, is a really good way to get them involved. Um, um, even at the NIH and the U.S. has actually dedicated fellowships, uh, sorry, dedicated funding pools for um, fellows, residents and fellows who are completing clinical trials. There's a completely separate pool that they can apply to to get some funding. Obviously, the uh, the amount allocated for these for that funding initiative is much less than some of their bigger, you know, randomized clinical trials. But there is at least some recognition at the NIH level that this is a, a fruitful thing to invest in um, to have trainees be successful with the research. Um, ultimately, funding is fiercely competitive um, and, um, you know, I don't think that a lack of successful funding decreases the merit of the work in any way. And at a minimum, if nothing else, again, taking it as a learning opportunity, um, what I, you know, it, I, there are, I have colleagues of mine that have been interested in research, et cetera, but haven't really to pursue formal research training, haven't been involved in funding applications, and now they're on staff and they're being asked to submit granting applications or be co-investigators on, on projects, and really they've not had the opportunity to do it. And so, I, you know, I've been very fortunate that the Raptor study itself has, you know, 
uh, given me the opportunity to submit um, funding uh, applications um, prior to being on staff and submitting them as you know, nominated uh, principal investigator. The next milestone was in 2018 when we recruited the first patient. And, um, you know, I think, boy, there was a lot of learning to be done. You know, the balancing act of clinical duties and uh, research uh, and conducting research is, is not to be uh, understated. It's really, really challenging to find the time to do everything. You know, I think there are um, uh, there are a couple of important things to remember here is that, you know, a trainee's time is not limitless. And um, there were times where I felt that, uh, you know, I had a lot on my plate. Um, but again, being part of a collaborative was really uh, helpful in terms of making sure that there were enough people to help out with projects to ensure that they're going to be successful uh, while not feeling totally overwhelmed. And I think there are ultimately are some pros and cons to dedicated uh, research years. So again, as I mentioned during my second year of cardiology residency, I was able to participate in 12 months consecutive of research uh, where I completed the coursework. And it was really nice to have that time to build the foundation um, to build the foundation that I was going to continue to build upon over the rest of my training clinically and, and research wise. Um, but I really like the fact that I did the fractionated program <coughs> because then I had to integrate um, sort of ongoing research um, with my clinical day to day practice. Right. And it was um, nice to have the dedicated time, but that's not realistic of how your career will be in the future. You know, many academic physicians are are busy, you know, having busy clinical practices while also trying to run successful research programs. And it can be very, very challenging to find time to uh, to do that all. And um, um, you know, again, this this uh, highlights uh, the importance of being part of a collaborative where other people can help kind of pick up the slack, if you will, whenever things are falling a bit behind because you're on a busy clinical service, etc. <clears throat> the next milestone was the pandemic. You know, I think the opportunity to learn on how to conduct uh, a clinical trial as a trainee, um, you know, um, Health Canada regulated study was difficult enough as it is, and then we threw in the wrench of the COVID pandemic. And um, um, I think it's important to develop the skills to become resilient and be adaptable uh, and not be rigid in kind of a research program. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic, I think, provided me with unique insight into the setbacks, delays, and frankly, failures that can happen over the course of conducting clinical research. And you know, we had to learn to recover from delays and disruptions in research activities due to lockdowns, resource limitations. Um, initially, we couldn't recruit for the Raptor study for uh, almost 18 months, <coughs> largely due to restrictions imposed by the hospital and research services. Then once we could open up to recruitment again, um, patients didn't want to come back. You know, the fact that they had that one month follow up ultrasound, they found very daunting and they wanted to avoid being in the hospital basically at all costs. And so you know, we couldn't get the patients recruited and we went from being able to recruit, you know, 10 to 12 patients per week for the study, which is a really nice kind of, you know, way to get the study done in a timely fashion to maybe recruiting one or two. And it was very, very practically quite challenging um, uh, to, to do this. Um, you know, at this point in time, um, we had uh, you know, uh, clinical research coordinators, which, you know, any patient that had been deemed either a high risk contact of COVID or, you know, whereas on you know, contact or droplet precautions for whatever reason couldn't be approached by uh, non sort of frontline staff. And so again, further decreasing the pool of people that we could approach for the study. And, you know, it, frankly, it was difficult to maintain motivation and focus um, um, as a result of all of these pandemic induced challenges. But as a group, we were able to finally rally and, you know, we had to come up with some some different ways in terms of, you know, trying to find ways to get patients uh, to participate in the study, if you will, you know, when patients were, we, if we knew they were coming back for an echo, for example, at, you know, three or four weeks time, we'd try to recruit them when they were coming for their echo, for example. And so we really had to um, uh, apply a lot of adaptability and flexibility and even our own schedules to try to make this again, further highlighting the fact that uh, collaboration was key because if I wasn't free, then Richard could go see the patient and follow up or Puya could go see the patient and follow up. And really, you know, we could all try to work together to be as adaptable as possible uh, throughout uh, the pandemic there. Um, <clears throat> the next sort of milestone in the Raptor study is when the principal investigator decides to leave for you know, this hospital known as the Mayo Clinic. 
and um, you know initially you know felt like a massive blow right when when Ben uh, left uh, in June of 2023 um, <clears throat> but one of the things that Ben constantly talked about was the importance of having a resident champion and um, this is something that you know he would talk about over and over again as being a, a key variable to ensuring success <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> Um, and I and I really don't think that the importance of having having a resident champion can be overstated. Um, you know, when as as the resident champion in the Raptor study, you know, I was very well versed and had an intricate knowledge of essentially all of the nuance to the study uh, in terms of standard operating procedures, you know, uh, study conduct, um, kind of where we were at with recruitment and and what some of the barriers were, et cetera. And I think that actually led to a fairly seamless transition uh, from, you know, Ben being the, the study PI here locally and the site PI to then having Dr. Labanas take over as the site PI. You know, I think really having that intricate knowledge of how the study worked from a practical perspective I think was key to ensuring its ongoing success um, you know and and I actually took a lot of you know pride and and uh, in the sort of ownership that I had taken of the study and I think that was a you know very rewarding experience um, that even though Ben was leaving and we were all saddened to see him leave I, I think fundamentally from a research perspective you know he ha he had done his part in terms of having us adequately trained to to sort of uh, continue um, with the work that, that was being done. Um, the next milestone is kind of the present. Um, so we're approaching 50% recruitment of the study. We're very excited for our next DSMB, which will be coming up in about 30 patients, and um, hopefully in the next couple of months. And really, I think um, this is the last principle that I want to talk about is this sort of progression towards more independence, graduated responsibility. I think that in clinical training, that's very well taught. You know that as you progress from internal medicine to cardiology to interventional cardiology, there's this graded experience that you have and you get more and more responsibility. And I actually think that research training should be done much, should be done much the same. You know, when I first started with the research group, if I had to tried to start up a randomized clinical trial, international, health Canada regulated, I would have, I would have you know, not succeeded, um, you know, but having been having had an opportunity to get more and more experience, you know, starting with a small retrospective uh, series of patients uh, that had two different types of stents. So that was the first project I ever did um, with uh, with Ben. You know, I was able to um, sort of grow and mature, get formalized research training, et cetera, and grow to the point where I think I, I feel capable now at the end of my training to be a clinical trialist, to have an ongoing expertise and and uh, you know, um, and I look forward to that opportunity. But again, it was this graded responsibility that I received over time that I think has been instrumental to the success. And I think I, ju I just want to, I just want to recap here. These are the eight points that I that I really want to highlight. And if the trainees in the room have tune into nothing else but this particular slide, I think this is just a very nice summary. If I could look back at myself ten years ago at the beginning of my journey, and I could sort of get advice. Uh, on on how how do I become successful as a research trainee while balancing all of the clinical work? These would be the eight things that I just talked about. That you know, again, I think I, having a lot of self reflection and introspection, so that you can figure out what it is that you want to accomplish, and being flexible with with that, and being realistic of what you think is feasible to accomplish um, as a as a uh, uh, trainee, I think it's key identifying the right mentor that cannot be stressed enough. I think having the support and encouragement from people uh, that want to that take pride in your success is, is essential as well. Um, you know, you want to develop these local, national and international networks. I don't think it's ever too early to apply for funding again, if nothing else, as a learning opportunity about how to put together a funding application, how to understand the nuance of, of how these funding decisions are made. You know, balancing clinical duties with research is exceedingly challenging, but really trying to figure out the strategies that can help you uh, be successful are key. And that includes things like the collaborative collaborative type model, um, you know, being able to develop the skills of resiliency and adaptability, you know, the importance of really championing your projects, right? Um, nobody cares about the projects like you do if you're the resident champion, you know, like, you know, right now, for example, Pui is getting the sedate trial up and running in the CCU. Pui is on call basically 24 seven for the study. He is truly the resident champion. He's able to, you know, he's available to the cardiology residents 24 seven if they need anything. If there's questions about candidacy eligibility of a patient, he's available even in the middle of the night. He came in on Mother's Day uh, to help recruit uh, a patient. You know, uh, you know, it's um, it's um, really, I think having these trainee champions will really help 
um, projects succeed. And I think adapting to trainee growth over time is a must. Again, that graded responsibility like we get clinically, we really should be getting uh, and from a research perspective as well. And I think that, you know, there are so many great projects that can be accomplished and have been accomplished here. And I, we have a, at the Heart Institute, I think we've got this culture that trainee involvement uh, is essential in research. And this list is not meant to be exhaustive in any way. And I apologize if I've missed anybody. Uh, but, you know, I just I, I think it's just I want to highlight a few uh, people here. So Ronan Mays, who uh, finished, I think, in 2014 or 2015. Um, you know, he was kind of the the resident lead behind the Capital Chill study. Um, you know, and and really worked hard uh, to get that study up and running. Um, uh, you know, a, a landmark paper, I will, if you will, in 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 uh, patients treated with. Uh, um, therapeutic hypothermia. Juan Russo, um, you know, he published a paper in Jack looking at different venting strategies in VA ECMO patients, a paper that's been cited, I don't know, 200, 250 times now uh, in the last couple of years. Um, Rebecca Matthew and I co-led the Dory Me study, um, again, all as trainees. Uh, Jason Roberts published the Rapid Gene uh, study in The Lancet. Ali Jabbar performed the uh, OptiCross study, which was, uh, you know, an RCT looking at how to switch patients between antiplatelets. Um, you know, Lee Sterling um, <clears throat> has um, really taken charge of the Lotus, um, which is the long-term cardio, long-term outcomes of, of uh, sort of ICU survivors, um, and uh, looked at the cardiogenic shock implications and published what I think will be a sort of seminal paper on on you know their outcomes, the first description of long-term outcomes of patients with cardiogenic shock in Jack just this past year. You know, Simon Parlow led a uh, the iRadial cabbage study, which was looking at photoplethysmography uh, using an iPhone to look at circulation to the hand before patients went for radial harvest, radial artery harvesting as a conduit for bypass surgery, you know, published in circulation. Uh, Jeff Marbeck uh, published uh, in the Annals of Internal Medicine this um, the implications and the diagnostic accuracy of POCUS in cardiovascular medicine. Again, a paper that's been cited, uh, you know, countless times. Uh, Dan Ramirez led the charge on sex bias in preclinical research. Um, you know, a paper that that has fundamentally changed the way that the editorial boards at uh, large, you know, AHA um, uh, journals are actually now have changed the way that they assess papers from a methodology perspective in the preclinical space as a result of the work that Dan has published. Um, and so I think that you know I've been very fortunate to be part of um, uh, this culture. For, for many years now. And I think a lot of my success is attributed to the opportunities afforded by having been a, a trainee here. And I and I do think that these opportunities do exist. You know, if you build it, they will come. It really, if you know, if the, the culture is that this is to be supportive, I do think that people will will um, uh, be successful. Um, and just just to wrap up here, because I'm running out of time and I do want to leave a few minutes for for discussion, you know, now that the training is quote unquote over, what's happening next? And as as uh, Dr. Stadnick mentioned, I'm starting on staff as an interventional critical care cardiologist here at the Heart Institute. Uh, and um, I think the evolution from trainee to mentor has already started for me. I've, I've you know, I take a lot of pride in being a peer mentor to a lot of my colleagues uh, within the collaboration. And I look forward to using my recent experience as a trainee, um, having gone through all of this training. Uh, to to really help, you know, the next generation of trainees be successful in their academic uh, pursuits. And we have many exciting projects in the works. Capital Minnows is a study that I'm co-leading with Ben, which is looking at transcatheter edge edge repair for severe mitral regurgitation in patients with anatropic dependent cardiogenic shock. This is in a vanguard phase right now. And uh, again, this is an international multi-center study. Well, as many of you know, we're uh, Rebecca and I are co-leading the uh, uh, Capital Dory Me2 study, which is looking at inatrial versus placebo for the management of cardiogenic shock. Um, Dan Ramirez um, is uh, working with Puya to look at this at the sedate study, so using dexmedetomidine uh, for patients in the acute treatment of electrical storm. You know, a study that I'm happy to be on the uh, trial steering committee for. And really, I think these are just uh, you know a couple of examples of some of the work that you know we're hoping to continue to accomplish. Um, uh, predominantly in a CCU space here, but also in the cath lab for me. I think there, there's a lot of great uh, work to come. And again, I couldn't have gotten here without so many different people, um, you know, mentors, peer mentors, uh, people that have been truly supportive over time. A lot of these faces you've already seen before, and I can't express enough um, how grateful I am for all of their support over time, and particularly to Ben. I think Ben has been uh, absolutely vital to my success as a as a uh, as I've developed into becoming a clinician scientist, and I look forward to all of the ongoing collaborations uh, that we'll have with him. Thank you.
Great, thank you very much, Pietro. There's a couple comments in the chat, and then if there's anybody in the room that has a uh, has a question, please let us know. Um, sorry here. Uh, so a question from uh, Dr. Quan Chan or comment. Um, Judging by number of publications, PhD programs uh, perform better than other programs. Uh, why not greatly expand the PhD program? I mean, I think that's a great question. You know, um, in terms of expansion of formalized research training opportunities, I think that would be great. I think it ultimately comes down to a lot of dollars and cents, and and frankly, PhD programs are quite expensive. You know, I think that I would be in favor of doing um, of doing that. But um, one of the things that that the epidemiology program has started to work on, for example, is actually working on a model by which MD PhD students could actually. Uh, complete a PhD in Epi as well, but which uh, historically has not been <coughs> has not been possible. Um, so I do think there are ways of, that people are trying to expand some of the programs. But again, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to funding largely. A uh, question or a comment from Dr. Bernie in the chat. So great talk. I would suggest uh, that to add to your eight principles of formal research training, uh, now essential if you want to uh, get uh, to the level of postdoctoral studies, whether uh, a master's or a PhD. Um, so I guess he's just, uh, again, highlighting the importance of formal research training, for which sure. I think you alluded to. For sure. I mean, uh, you know, preaching to the choir with that one, for sure. I do I do see a lot of value. Again, we, we train clinically to become experts in what we're doing. Um, you know, cardiology training has now routinely become seven, eight years of clinical training. You know, I don't I don't see why we wouldn't uh, sort of strive to achieve formalized research training as well. Again, because there are varying levels at which people will want to participate in research, but formalized research training will be will make you a better doctor. You will have a better ability to, you know, understand medical literature, perform critical appraisal, um, and they 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 go hand in hand. Again, medicine is evolving rapidly, um, and so I do think that um, you know formalized research training is is would be ideal. Are there any questions or comments, uh, Dr. Greenlands? Thanks, Pietro. Great talk and congrats again on your award. Thank you. um, uh, fantastic to see the your progress for the ranks too. Um, uh, so I have a question about, uh, I think it's great that the program identifies uh, early the training for research and so on. Um, on the other side of the coin, there are many investigators who would love to be working with trainees. And I don't think we've always connected those dots as well as we could. Um, how would you propose to enable that for other areas, uh, people, other investigators wanting to enable trainees, et cetera, et cetera? I think that's that's a great question. I, and And again, this comes back to finding the right fit for each individual trainee and for the mentor as well. You know, I think that um, there are varied interests, right? If you have no interest in interventional cardiology or critical care cardiology, coming to do research with our group is, is you know, a bit more challenging, right? It's not impossible, but it is more challenging versus if, you know, you envision yourself becoming a an imager, going to work with people like yourself, I think would be a great opportunity. And I think that one of the things that we can do is, um, you know, and, and this has historically been done, although I don't think it's updated regularly, is kind of having this ongoing list of people who are interested in taking people under their wing. Um, and um, uh, with potential like research areas that then can sort of be connected uh, in a formalized way. Um, the Department of Medicine does do that a little bit with their internal medicine program. Um, they kind of have this Excel sheet with lists of names of people looking for trainees to be involved in work and kind of what they're working on. Um, that might be something we could explore here. Um, I don't know if like having a bit of like an, uh, an exhibition type day, like an expo where, you know, the staff can kind of like be available in an informal setting, uh, you know, and, and just sort of discuss some of their, you know, round table type discussions about what their research programs look like. And again, I think, you know, this all starts from the ground up. I think, you know, if if as a, as a mentor, you're able to identify one or two key people that have an interest in this particular area and you really take the time to nurture and cultivate them, that will continue to grow and propagate, you know, um, uh, you know, as, you know, frankly speaking, we get a lot of emails regarding, you know, medical students, uh, residents who want to come and do research with our group. And I think a lot of it has to do with kind of the reputation that's been established. Right. And I think 
that um, it, it took a lot of work, particularly on Ben's part, to get that that momentum going. Um, and um, I think as a, as a mentor, if you try to invest the time and effort into that, I think, you know, hopefully that would improve um, the ability to have varying research opportunities available to, to the trainees. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, that brings us to the end of rounds this morning. Please join us next week. Dr. Scott Millington is going to be talking to us about uh, the uh, virtual ICU program that they've developed. Have a good week. Thank you, everyone.